Can you hear me, Jen? <laughs> Just checking the back stalls. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Lisa Hasker. Um, I'm from Vic Sport, and we have uh, team members Anthony Bowd here, Grant Richardson, and Caitlin Stratton helping us with this event today. Um, and I will introduce our guest speaker, Governance. Um, welcome to the people in the room. Welcome to those who are online as well. Before I introduce our speaker, can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, it's good to see a mix of um, CEOs. Who's a CEO or acting CEO? Who's a board member? Great to see a mix of both because you are vitally important to the governance of the organisation. Most of you are probably here because you've had an issue and you want to overcome that for next time, or you're looking to improve, or you're new to a board or new to a CEO's role and you want to know about governance. Obviously today um, we're talking about uh, one part of governance and we've got three in the series. Um, and thank you to SRV for supporting us in, in this and to Landers and Rogers for this amazing venue and our guest speaker. Um, but can I start with a couple of housekeeping things? Um, if you need, if you're on site and you need to go to the bathroom, they're behind the drink taps. You'll know what I mean when you head out into the foyer, head out to your left. Um, if we need to escape, we'll head to reception and, and get our instructions from our receptionist. Uh, but thank you for making the effort to come in today. There'll obviously be lots of time for questions. Those in the room can raise their hand through Simon's presentation. Those online, please pop any questions in the chat and we will cover those either as we go through or at the end of the presentation. Um, and for those on site, there's food and drink available for you. So if you're desperate for a drink along the way, jump up and come back and sit down or we'll um, have some time at the end for that. Um, we're presenting, as I said, a series of gov governance forums, um, developing your capacity, both CEOs and directors. Um, the other sessions that we'll have after today are risk management, sport integrity and improving diversity and inclusion. Um, today's session, Board Policies and Procedures, will be presented by Simon Merritt, Special Counsel with Landers. Um, and I lean on Simon for a lot of matters from a Vic Sport point of view. Hopefully not too many governance ones, Simon, but you never know. But when we don't have the governance right and we don't have the policies in place, that's when we have problems. Because when a problem comes up and you can't grab a policy to deal with it, it makes your life a lot more difficult. And I've been in that situation a lot in various roles in sport and on boards along the way. And it takes a while to get things right as you have new boards, um, you have new people, uh, you have new situations that you have to deal with. But it is worth the time and effort. Um, obviously, you're getting help from us and from Simon here today. We have a stack of resources on our website and you can always lean on Anthony and myself if you need support, where to turn, what resource might help you with what situation because we've probably dealt with most of them along the way, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, and there's new things that are popping up every now, you know, as we go through and become more... Um, digital cyber security policies, how to deal with things in that space as well. So um, today we are very lucky to have Simon Merritt from Land and Rogers here to help us. Um, Simon is special counsel. I really like his title. It sounds very um, regal. Um, Simon's going to take us through a presentation. He's happy to have questions um, from the floor if something comes up along the way, but we'll obviously take questions at the end and Anthony will put forward the questions in the chat that come from everyone that's online. But thank you. Thank you for attending and um, it's good to see everyone and I'll hand over to Simon. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Uh, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, as Lisa mentioned, uh, hopefully uh, you find something in today's presentation uh, useful. Um, we'll certainly uh, have the slides to share uh, through Vic Sport throughout, uh, oh, sorry, after the presentation. So there's uh, quite a bit of content on the slides and we're not going to touch on all of it in detail. There's a lot there that I've included uh, just so you have it in the slides as a resource to take away, particularly for 
uh, the directors in the room who uh, might not have um, regular access to that type of thing. So I uh, hope you uh, enjoy today's session. Hopefully it's not too dry for you. Uh, certainly um, if I see you evacuating to the back, it'll probably because it's a little bit too dry. Um, so we'll take that into account for next time. Uh, but more than happy to take questions, um, just raise your hand and Anthony at the back will bring the roving mic so people online can also hear the question as well. Uh, so being, I'm sure everyone here's uh, AFL supporters, being a, a long time sort of 30 year SNN member, it pains me greatly to bring these quotes up. Um, I'm sure many in the room will recognise them from uh, relating to the Essendon drugs scandal or saga in 2013. They come from the uh, post-scandal governance report by Ziggy Switkowski uh, in relation to the, the failings that caused that. So whilst um, board policies, procedures, corporate governance, um, it's, it's critically important, but it's not something that many people within organisations, and particularly sport organisations, noting at the state level, uh, many of your organisations might have minimal or no staff. So there's a whole range of other things that directors, committee members will be doing that uh, directors of larger organisations, large corporates, listed entities may not be doing. Um, it's, it's critically important to remember that if you don't have these types of things right, whilst you're not guaranteeing that you won't succeed, you're setting up the conditions uh, for failure. And whilst good people are, are probably the most fundamental aspect of having an organisation and the sort of quote around um, culture eats strategy for breakfast, but if you have corporate governance failings, uh, they can lead to these types of fairly significant issues. And it's not necessarily um, individual failings of, of one or more people, and it might not be deliberate by any one individual, but if you create the conditions where people don't know what they're doing, they might have overlapping roles and responsibilities. The left hand doesn't talk to the right hand about what an organisation's doing. Um, that's when organisations, individuals can have uh, difficulties and unintended consequences. So here's what we will touch on today. So as I said, hopefully there's uh, at least something in there that uh, you might have as a useful takeaway. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll circulate the slides so you've got them as a resource going forward. So just a, a very brief background about when we're talking about board policies and procedures, we're, we're generally talking about uh, the overarching sort of topic of corporate governance. So uh, again, particularly for the directors in the room with, with staff at their SSO, the dichotomy of what the board should be doing versus what management should be doing is is of fundamental importance. And again, the lines get really blurred in sport because of the size of the organisations. And if you're looking at a grassroots club, generally no staff, the, the management committee or the board will often be undertaking a lot of the day-to-day -day activities as well because there might not be anyone else. That might be the whole point of them volunteering for the board. But as organisations get larger, and particularly uh, for, for SSOs, there's, there's many that do have staff, some that have significant levels of staffing. Um, the differing roles and responsibilities of sort of what we would very technically legally refer to as different organs of the company or incorporated association become really important. Uh, so a couple of... Uh, other topics that we'll be going through today. The first stop point, again, is critical for sports because it's very much a stakeholder business. You're generally member-based organisations. You'll have voting members that might be clubs, associations, or you might have individuals as, as your voting members. But either way, you will have a really large participant base of the sport uh, that are your stakeholder grouping. So. Uh, being able to respond to both changing market conditions, COVID obviously um, it's a great example of that, how sports had to adapt, um, particularly if there was no ability to have on-field competitions during that period. Uh, it's highly critical um, that as not generally you will all be not-for-profit organisations, so the ability to ensure that you fundamentally comply with and follow your not-for-profit objects, uh, not only a legal requirement, but if we're talking about sort of 
sporting organisations as a for-purpose type of entity. Um, that's the the critical sort of mission statement of these organisations. Uh, so we'll touch on the other dot points uh, as we go along as well. So first things first, uh, generally you'll all be entities, so you all should have a constitution. Hopefully it doesn't look as old as that one. Uh, we have, I have worked with a client that had a 1927 original date in their documents. That's about the oldest that I've seen so far, but uh, I could, could see older. Um, so if we're talking about board policies and procedures, you, you really need to go back to the, the source at the highest level, and that's the constituent uh, governing rules of the entity, whether you're a, generally a company limited by guarantee or incorporated association, because ultimately that's the fundamental governing rules of your organisation. It delineates powers between different organs of the entity. Uh, it will set out your board composition. It will set out what powers your voting members have. It will talk about delegations, potentially to a CEO, to committees, to other individuals. So if you're thinking about both the power to make board policies and procedures, how they can be legally effective, uh, you're really needing to look at this document initially as the place where you have as boards, potentially now also management might have the power to adopt and implement certain policies. Uh, you're looking at this document to find that sort of legal power to be able to bind both people internally within the organisation, whether that's uh, staff or committee members, and then for sport, most prevalently, people uh, who are members of your organisation. So whether that's adopting whole of sport policies that the NSO uh, adopts that flow down, or you might have a range of state specific policies as well. So for incorporated associations, you need to ensure that you meet the statutory requirements for what a Victorian IA constitution contains. Um, there's a list in the legislation. It's of critical importance because if you don't include them all, then the model rule section for that topic area applies. So um, you don't want a scenario where part of your constitution is actually sitting outside it and no one knows what it is. Uh, and similarly, there'll be other not-for-profit requirements under the tax legislation that, that need to be included. So I've set out some of the key clauses in that document, which hopefully for everyone in the room um, shouldn't be a surprise. The objects, uh, that's your fundamental purpose as an organisation. It's why you're entitled to income tax exemption and it constrains what you can legally do as an organisation. Your members, they're your primary stakeholders. It'll set out who's a member, how they can become a member and who are the voting members most you know, for, for these purposes quite importantly because they will have certain statutorily enshrined powers around what members can do. Obviously, the board, the board composition, whether there's a combination of elected, appointed, ex officio directors, the terms of those directors, the rotation, how they're elected, how they're appointed, uh, things like that. And then going back to board policies and procedures, the division of powers. So what can the board delegate? How can it delegate? What does it need to do for a, a valid uh, legal delegation. So uh, we'll touch, touch on that in the, the delegation section of the uh, presentation, but from a corporate governance perspective, there are some of the uh, fundamental clauses in the document and certainly as directors and, and as executives at SSOs, uh, you certainly, if you're not, if you can't in your own head think of broadly the relevant uh, content in these areas of your constitution, then certainly recommend that you hit the books and have a read of uh, the document to see what it says in relation to those areas. Um, we'll touch on board disputes and some areas where we often get called in as legal advisors. And there is a probably a significant portion of, in the corporate governance space, queries that we get where uh, people who should know better simply haven't actually read the relevant document and what it says and who needs to retire when, et cetera. So, uh, it's certainly of critical importance. Uh, and then just really high level stuff around um, corp the, when we're talking about corporate governance, your corporate entities, so why incorporate uh, the legal protection that you get from having the separate legal persona of the entity. So 
uh, if you are an unincorporated association, it would be the group of individuals who would be entering into contracts and holding liability in relation to various things. Whereas uh, when you incorporate an association or register a company, uh, it has its own legal persona, can enter into contracts in its own name, sue and be sued. So really that those couple of uh, things are the, the fundamental requirements. Uh, so you're eligible for not-for-profit status. Uh, but with, with those benefits comes obligations and, and some potentially quite onerous obligations that, that we'll touch on. So obligations of office holders, uh, everyone should be broadly aware that they exist. Um, you might not be fully across uh, the breadth of them. We'll, we'll touch on most of them today, but they are of critical importance. They're a fiduciary relationship, which is a, a type of legal relationship um, that only the most special circumstances uh, gives rise to. Think sort of teacher-student, doctor-patient type relationships. So that's the level of importance that the law places on uh, the position of a director of an entity and the responsibilities of those individuals to put the organisation uh, first in decision making and certainly above individual interests. Uh, so we'll, we'll touch on a range of those obligations today as well. Uh, so those duties of directors stem from a range of sources. There's statutory obligations. So the Corporations Act has a very uh, stringent list of directors duties that apply to all companies under it. So broadly speaking, a company limited by guarantee does not have different obligations of its directors compared to listed entities or other private companies in the purely directors duty space. Uh, because the Victorian associations legislation is quite new, uh, it has, um, of all the sort of state and territory jurisdictions, its directors or office holders obligations are uh, at the more onerous end and sort of broadly mirror what the Corporations Act uh, imposes on individuals. There are significantly reduced penalties, which is great, um, but the general obligations are pretty synonymous, um, which is a different position in some of the other states with older legislation and uh, only have sort of minimal obligations in that area. Uh, and then separately to legislation, there's also a range of common law or case law uh, directors duty obligations that in a range of areas actually expand on what the legislation says uh, and also interprets how the legislation applies across a range of cases where regulators have taken action against individuals or boards collectively. Uh, and if we think about some of the Royal Commissions recently, particularly the financial institution uh, version, uh, then we're looking, then if you read some of the case studies or just the media articles about that, you can see some of the failings, uh, not only that, but what can lead from that. And certainly from a legal perspective, if we're talking about it, you're thinking about personal liability, but there are a whole range of other more practical and more likely negative outcomes that can arise at the organisational level. And, and particularly for sports where reputation, goodwill is one of your strongest and most uh, leverageable values and benefits, um, that's really important. So broadly speaking, when we're talking about director's duties, the couple of primary ones are for individuals to act in good faith and for the benefit of the organisation. And a lot of the time, the pub test is pretty applicable for this type of thing. If something seems like it would fail the pub test, then there's a pretty good chance that it crosses over into possible director's duty breach territory. Uh, and that's often, or that's primarily because most of the duties, you're talking about the reasonable person. So it's an objective test around what the reasonable person would do in a particular situation. So you don't have to worry about uh, being extremely overly cautious because the duties give the ability for two boards in the exact same position to come to genuinely different decisions on matters. Um, but you're working within the confines of the objective test where 
what a reasonable person would do in those circumstances. So two reasonable people can have quite contrasting decisions and outcomes and responses to a set of circumstances, but it still has to be within the, the bands of reasonability. And then, yeah, the two primary liability aspects are civil penalties from the regulator. So Corporations Act, ASIC or Incorporated Associations, Consumer Affairs Victoria. Uh, there are provisions in each of the sets of legislation where um, breaches are essentially an automatic uh, breach and subject to a civil penalty provision. Uh, much less likely, but still theoretically possible is uh, members of an organisation can actually technically take legal action against uh, individuals or the board in circumstances where there's been a breach and the organisation suffers material loss as well. So let's touch on those duties to start with, and we're working from the incorporated associations legislation um, based on the, the attendee list. It looks like more of you are from IAs than uh, companies limited by guarantee or CLGs, um, but essentially everything that we go through here is equally applicable under the, the Corporations Act. So the IA Act refers to office holders. So it's important to note that that goes further than simply directors of the organisation. So there's the full definition of uh, who constitutes an office holder. Member of the committee and secretary are pretty straightforward, but these next three uh, captures concepts that sort of broadly mirror, if you've heard the term shadow director or uh, often senior management within the organisation will fall into these uh, subheadings because the law recognises that through the seniority of their position, they can make and have delegated power to make a range of decisions that materially impact the organisation in a similar way to what our board decisions can do. So uh, it's, it's important to note the broad nature of who might actually be caught. Uh, so if we're talking about the sport context, uh, certainly uh, the CEO will almost certainly be caught if you have a general manager or a C-suite type level that has significant delegation ability, then they're probably going to be caught. You might have uh, a range of subcommittees, for instance, that uh, may not be directors and they may, under the terms of reference or the power of delegation, have a range of powers that potentially capture those individuals under one or more of these subheadings. So uh, it's important from a personal perspective, particularly uh, if you're a director of one sport and you might choose to sit on a subcommittee for a particular topic area of another sport, uh, it's it's critical for you yourself to have a think about whether you would actually uh, constitute an office holder or a, a director or officer under the Corps Act um, from your own perspective, because then you move into territory like, is there a deed of indemnity in place? Are you covered under the constitutional indemnity? Are you covered by the directors and officers insurance, et cetera, which we'll again touch on uh, later in the, the session. Uh, and obviously, last dot point, uh, straightforward, but sometimes um, we find misunderstood. Um, if you're a director, then you're caught irrespective of how you were appointed, elected, and whether you're filling a casual vacancy. So um, fairly straightforward, but sometimes missed. So here's some of the main duties that apply to SSO directors. Uh, I'm not going to read them all out, but those those first two are really the the most common from a director's duty sense, whether you're talking about CLGs or IAs, and that's where uh, really the bulk of the case law and uh, issues arise. So the first two are the primary duties. The next two are exclusions where you can actually have a defence personally uh, in relation to a decision or an allegation that you've breached those uh, duties. So the 84 sub 2 uh, exclusion or defence uh, in relation to business judgment, so that broadly applies across both sets of legislation. Uh, it's really important on that one to emphasise 
the rational belief of a reasonable person requirement. So when we talk about business judgment, we're talking about the ability that I mentioned for two boards to come to different decisions from a, the same set of circumstances, but it has to pass the objective test and it has to be rational. So decision-making at a board level is subjective in the sense that the individuals have to collectively decide on the course of action. But in the back of your mind, you should always be keeping uh, taking into account the need for uh, reasonableness and the rationale for decisions. 86 re relates to reliance on information or advice. So this covers where you're as a you as a director or as a board are making decisions based on external or extraneous information that you have received. So that might be from professional advisors like lawyers, accountants, auditors, and the like. It covers when management has provided information to directors. So if you've sought information from the CFO or finance, if you've got a finance person within the organisation, that type of uh, thing. But as we'll see from um, one of the seminal director's duty cases, which if anyone's done the AICD course or even done some sort of high level reading in the space, it's not going to cover you this defence if you simply take advice, even if it's from professional advisors external to the organisation, uh, without turning your mind to it, without critiquing it in the way that a reasonable director in the, the position would. So it's highly important that when you, particularly when you pay for external advice, uh, that you don't simply uh, rubber stamp something uh, and decision making out to an external body as a board uh, because you're then not actually satisfying your obligations under your director's duties. Anthony, I think we've got a question down the front if you've got the mic. Thanks very much. Um, you were talking about external advice. Um, would similar situation apply if it's say a subcommittee is tasked with doing a job and they come back with a recommendation? What would be the expectations of the remainder of the board? Particularly sometimes because um, uh, questioning a subcommittee, um, the subcommittee might feel like you're not trusting them. Yeah, it's a really good question. And in, in the sporting context, it's a really, it's a big challenge because exactly as you point out, you, you're generally dealing with volunteers at, at all these levels. So you you have to maintain an approach that is going to increase the likelihood that you retain existing volunteers and attract new ones. But fundamentally, and we'll touch on this in the delegation section, referring certain matters and delegating certain matters to a subcommittee does not in any way absolve the board and the individual directors of responsibility and liability for decisions that are uh, ultimately made, irrespective of whether the, ter the terms of reference give the subcommittee the power to do it without board approval or pre-approval or involvement at all. Uh, that doesn't in any way absolve the board. Um, so you as individuals maintain responsibility for outcomes resulting from that. So it's generally, in our experience, a couple of important things are to ensure that there is sufficient dialogue between the board and a, a import, particularly important and highly active committees. So that, that can range from director representation on the committee, for instance. So you might have one or two directors on a, on a subcommittee. It's, it might be about the way you set up the terms of reference and the delegation. So whether they have to have decisions pre-approved by the board or whether there's a time lag in when decisions are affected with a requirement to share minutes from committee meetings that are circulated to the board so that you're building in a review process for the directors to cast their eye over those decisions. Um, but we work in a practical world, so you've got to balance that up around the fact that by definition, you're delegating certain tasks to them because they might be subject 
matter specialists. It might be a, a high performance subcommittee dealing with your pathways and team selection and the like. So you might have people on that subcommittee that know the subject matter better than most of the directors. So you've got to take each each scenario as it comes and work through that that fine balance. Uh, so not not to be overly negative, but they they are the offences, um, the primary offences under the incorporated association legislation. Uh, it's it's really important that um, to to emphasise these offences relate to using information that you get or the position that you hold for personal advantage or for material benefit for yourself, as opposed to the organisation. So. It, it is actually quite hard to reach the level of uh, undertaking these offences because they generally won't necessarily expand to simply poor decisions of the board that, that lead to bad outcomes. There has to be that sort of next level where a person can be proven to have made a decision or even uh, tried to argue for a particular course of action for uh, impermissible reasons for their own financial advantage. So we don't really see it a lot in sport, but common examples that can arise would be, for instance, having a director who might have ownership stake in a third party business or have a direct family member that's got an ownership stake in a business and a director pushing hard for a contract with that third party in a particular area really for the reason that there's going to be a, a benefit to them personally or through to their direct family. Um, so that's probably the most common scenario that we see in sport. Um, and it, it directly relates to conflicts of interest and how they need to be properly dealt with, which we'll, we'll touch on. But um, again, in sport, when you start thinking about high performance, uh, it's again, personal familial relationships in the high performance pathway that can also get individual directors into trouble um, in these areas. So uh, it's important to note there are automatic um, financial sanctions under the IA Act, um, which are significantly less than the Corporations Act for the CLGs, but uh, still apply. And then for company directors, they're, they're significantly uh, higher. Question. Um, how would the 83-4 um, penalty apply for, say, sponsorships? So if you have a board member whose business sponsors your high-performance team or a National League team, something like that. So as a starting point, that that probably the way that uh, that scenario operates where there's actually money flowing into the sport, it's already rather than flowing out of the sport to someone else, it, it would be more difficult to see that scenario fitting under these offences. But at the same time, it, it certainly could because the sponsor will inherently be getting a range of benefits from the sport around exposure, marketing rights, collateral, etc. So in these types of areas, properly disclosing and dealing with conflicts of interest will almost certainly allow people to avoid undertaking these offences. So our advice is always for, for individuals to uh, disclose, even if they may not have a legal need to disclose an interest or a material interest. Uh, and then if it does become a conflict, it's critical that individuals know their own responsibilities because they do whilst the board can do certain things to deal with conflicts, if an individual director has a material personal interest in a matter, there are a range of conflict obligations that apply to you individually. So if you've disclosed and then generally that triggers the minds of the directors to think, what, what do we need to do here to deal with it? Um, and we'll touch on that later in the presentation. That should generally be the way that you can avoid that type of scenario. Uh, so any, anyone that's done any reading on directors' duties and um, respond, roles and responsibilities of directors should know the Centro case. It's the seminal uh, case in Australia dealing with these types of issues. And there's a whole range of commentary and other materials that summarise it really well for you to, to read. So 
if you were wanting a takeaway from today around where can I go to get some really digestible advice around director's duties and what I need to do as an individual to turn my mind to things, then just Google Centro director's duties and there'll be a range of materials that AICD, Governance Institute, law firms have, have put out previously. Um, but just very briefly, this case related to about $500 million worth of uh, what were uh, short-term liabilities that had been incorrectly uh, listed as non-current in the financial statements of the group. Um, the issue at hand was the directors had relied on the audit and the position that the auditor had taken in relation to this matter and uh, of primary importance and what the judgment really goes into depth about is uh, what critique, what questions to reasonable directors that are fulfilling their uh, duties need to ask of external professional advisors in relation to key matters of the organisation, like the annual financial statements, for instance. Um, so have a look at it. It's really good reading uh, and it goes into a lot of detail about these topics. So here's uh, some of the other, not, not less important, but probably um, some of them less commonly seen uh, in our experience. So conflicts is a big one and we'll touch on that um, shortly. Confidential information uh, is one, that's probably the one that we see most egregiously and commonly breached in sporting organisations. So uh, as we'll touch on in the board conflict part of this presentation, we very commonly get the question from sport clients around individual directors who have leaked sensitive board information or discussed uh, board matters that are confidential with others within the, the sport, whether it's members, whether it's stakeholders, whether it's the NSO, whole range of other third parties. So uh, this confidential information and the requirement to keep information that you gain through your position and through board deliberations confidential um, should be the easiest one to comply with because it's fairly straightforward, but um, it's certainly one that we see breached fairly commonly. Uh, the duty not to make improper use of information really links to um, those offences that we saw and generally if you breach that duty, you will have um, can undertaken one of those offences. Uh, and then insolvent trading, again, should be um, relatively straightforward, but obviously you start getting into um, potentially fairly tricky territory, particularly for smaller organisations when you might have questions about ongoing solvency depending on certain future circumstances, for instance, or um, the existence of uh, current facilities that might be that you might be in breach of or uh, potential future revenues that you're banking on but are not sort of legally entitled to at that point. So um, the insolvent trading one can't can't stress enough the need to get professional advice from accountant, auditor, legal if you have concerns in that area because that's that's one where unless you have experienced CPAs or orders on your board, then you may generally not have um, the level of expertise needed to work through both whether you are solvent, which has a, a pretty standard test but can get quite tricky, and if you're questionable, what steps you could take in future to ensure the viability of the organisation. Uh, so again, touching on uh, the civil penalties, um, under the Corporations Act, uh, there are a range of uh, civil penalty provisions. So for company directors, uh, it's worth actually reading them for yourself. Uh, the incorporated association legislation really only has those two offences that uh, I listed, but similarly to company directors, it doesn't, uh, simply because you're an incorporated association doesn't absolve you from potential common law 
uh, action or action by members. So uh, even though you might not have committed a civil offence under the IA legislation, uh, it doesn't mean that there's no liability exposure on a technical basis. Uh, so quick show of hands for, for the directors in the room, how many of your organisations have a sort of template deed of access indemnity insurance that uh, you have signed when you become a director? So there's not many hands up. Probably, I'm not sure how many of you are directors, in the, but probably less than half. So uh, one really important thing to think about as individuals and for organisations because you want to attract the best possible people that you can is access to indemnities as an individual through your uh, through undertaking your role in good faith. So uh, it's common practice for larger organisations for it to be a requirement of all office holders to enter into that type of deed with the organisation. Uh, it will generally cover three or four discrete topic areas. So the first one and the, the most beneficial one for an individual is the indemnity that the organisation provides you in relation to undertaking your role. So practical example, you have a third party and might probably most commonly a member sues the organisation and joins the board as a defendant in their, in their personal capacities for some kind of loss or damage or negligence. Uh, then if you are in, uh, covered by an indemnity of the organisation and you don't fall within one of the exclusions, which will generally relate to fraud or bad faith actions or criminal conduct, then the organisation is required to, to indemnify you under that deed. Uh, generally, there'll be an indemnity in the constitution that applies to directors, but often it doesn't expand to some of the other office holder categories that we saw uh, constitute an office holder under the IA Act. So that's when it, that's when it's important to have a deed of indemnity in place. Other topic areas covered by that document include insurance. So what insurances the organisation is required to take out on your behalf. Uh, and then access to documents is another one that is of quite, in, quite high level of importance to individual directors because it will generally include a right for ex-directors to have access to certain records of the organisation for a period in time in future after you cease to hold office, which is generally seven years. And where that's critical is if someone sues the organisation uh, and there are individual directors joined, or if there's a regulator that takes a look at certain decisions and decides to take action, often that'll be two, three, four years down the track you might not be a director anymore, so you don't have an automatic right to documents because you don't hold office anymore. Um, so that's why from a personal perspective, it's uh, really beneficial to have that deed in place because it will contain an ongoing right for you to access documents in defined circumstances, which will include if you're defending a claim that you're a party to. And that doesn't only cover just pure litigation, but often it will cover preliminary steps like a regulator potentially just investigating a matter. So often individuals in those circumstances will want representation and often they may want separate representation to the organisation. So really important to have those things in writing and a deed that you can file away in your back pocket, in your, in your top drawer to know that uh, for that period in the future, you can uh, pull out that deed if needed uh, and enforce it. And then insurance is obviously another critical one because in those circumstances that I just mentioned, uh, it would generally be the case that directors and officers insurance uh, would cover you uh, and there's runoff cover that um, you should check with your organisation as to whether you have runoff, what period it applies post you holding office uh, and any of the applicable exclusions. Uh, they will generally include those, those matters that I mentioned. So anything the organisation can't indemnify you for under statute, uh, fraud, potentially um, gross negligence, possibly uh, criminal offences, acting in bad faith. Those are generally the exclusions where uh, you may be on your own, um, but 
critically important because in in reality, if ASIC uh, decides to sue four of the directors of an organisation in relation to a matter and seek civil penalty provisions, seek the enforcement of civil penalty provisions, seek banning orders for uh, those individuals. Um, if you want to defend that to the fullest extent, then in reality, you're, you're talking about to three hundred thousand dollars, probably in in legal fees and other expenses. Um, so you would absolutely want to be safe in the knowledge that you've got DNO cover um, that will generally cover most of that that, that expense. So humour there. So hopefully. For the directors in the room, nothing should leap out at you there as um, news. The, the last dot point we've touched on for the SSOs here with staff or with um, a high le higher level of staff, uh, this is where we see some blurring of the lines. Um, we work for a range of AFL clubs, for instance, and um, we have had a comment by numerous directors that when they have to start making decisions about the team that they support that they're also a director of they hang their brain up at the door when they go in because they um, are dealing with uh, sort of passion as opposed to rational objectivity and they they start uh, potentially uh, getting involved in management areas that their uh, role is not a part of so um, that's a critical one for sport, uh, but otherwise those key functions should be pretty self-explanatory. So again, looking at overarching sort of functions of the board, again, nothing should jump out there. Um, really, when we're talking about board policies and procedures, that first uh, point is critical because it's going to be impossible to monitor the organisation's performance and how it's tracking if you don't have both policies and procedures in place and also uh, longer term things like strategic plans and sort of two, five, ten year plans that management and other stakeholders are working towards. So when we think about policies and procedures in corporate governance, often we're really talking about getting the higher level processes adopted and in place and understood so you can actually benchmark against those and if you don't have those in place then really any kind of benchmarking activity um, becomes very difficult and potentially unproductive because you're not uh, able to assess against proper documents. Again we touched on constitution, so board composition is dealt with there, but within your breakdown of you might have six elected and three appointed, for instance, um, there is a range of factors to take into account to get uh, an effective board composition that will suit the needs of your organisation both uh, today and into the future. And uh, this is certainly an area that we've seen a lot of probably substantial movement in over the past five to ten years both through the sports commission pushing uh, in their governance standards that apply to NSOs um, around diversity on the board initially uh, in relation to gender composition but organizations um, and regulators and things like the ASX governance principles are now looking at diversity as a whole rather than simply focusing on uh, gender diversity on boards. Um, there's a whole range of literature out there that's empirical that uh, sets out the benefits of having a d diverse board and the increased effectiveness of board decision making where you have improved and increased diversity on boards. So. Um, it's certainly there are a range of empirical materials out there if um, people are in, within your organization um, are yet to be convinced around the benefits of these types of improvements then uh, unlike for some other topic areas you can go and get hard data on uh, these matters and it's, it's relatively easy to find through google searches so if we're talking about the sport context 
Um, moving from representative to skills-based boards has been probably the biggest change in the 11 years that I've worked in the sport and leisure team here. Um, it's flowed from national level down to state levels uh, where historically each state would nominate a, a director onto the national board and um, would be able to rotate that person as required and often SSOs had a similar arrangement um, with associations, regions, et cetera, uh, whereas it's certainly been a move to skills-based boards being predominantly in place within the sporting landscape now. Uh, and again, an independent chair, uh, particularly one appointed by the directors as opposed to direct election from the membership has been uh, another change that's slowly, in our experience, permeating through the industry. Uh, so again, we would see usually between five and nine directors on a sporting board, um, pretty commonly across all levels of sport, both NSOs and SSOs. For context, I think the last stat I read, the average ASX board size is 7.8 at the moment. So um, certainly within that, within that band at the higher level, um, generally organisations with more than nine directors can become pretty unwieldy and uh, sort of strangled decision making and slower response times uh, compared to if you have a, a little bit smaller, more agile or nimble board um, and highlight the importance of subcommittees and working groups, particularly for organisations that are coming from a history of potentially very high numbers. We've seen Organisations with 14, 15 directors previously, which sort of stems from um, the, the historical nature of sort of governance councils that a range of sporting organisations had um, either separate to or, or as their board. Um, so if organisations are receiving pushback in relation to those areas, there are a range of other methods that you can adopt to in, uh, decrease your board, board size, but still retain people in decision making. And then recommendations around board independence, again, should be um, fairly straightforward. Um, just a question around boards and your thoughts on this. So taking it down from an SSO level down to association that we sort of have underneath us, where do you sit with a lot of them, as we say, are volunteers, but we do have some associations that have pay some people like an honorarium or that sort of thing that then kind of sit on the boards as well. Where does that all sit? Uh, certainly. So if you're talking about strictly legally, as long as you've got the relevant provisions in your governing rules, then it's permissible and it, it wouldn't in any way harm your not-for-profit status. Um, where there is some risk is if organisations don't have the right clauses in their constitution or, for instance, don't get member approval for those payments, then there is actually a, a real risk that they're infringing their requirements under the, the income tax legislation, which is dealing with no payments to members or directors except in permitted circumstances. Um, so that's the, that's the first point from a legal perspective. Uh, from, from a policy perspective, uh, it's certainly, uh, in our experience, while not common for sports, it is absolutely there are a range of organisations out there that, that do it, both at the honorarium level and actually remunerating director level. And, and you look at the, the professional sports, obviously, they uh, will often have a remunerated board, although, although not all. Um, certainly, it can be... It, it, it's interesting because from sport to sport you talk to, sometimes they'll say it's a driver for increased uh, volunteerism on boards, um, but you talk to other people and, and they will have the, the completely contrasting view that it makes no difference, but it's a nice to have and a way of essentially showing a, a token of the, the organisation's appreciation for the effort. So certainly uh, I would probably say it's it's very, it's very less than 10, 15% of the, the organisations that we see in the sport industry have that sort of process in place. But yeah, ra range too. And certainly if you set it up correctly, there's absolutely no problems with doing it. 
Yeah, it comes down to, so generally speaking, you would need, uh, because under the tax legislation to maintain not-for-profit status, you have to have certain clauses in the constitution. And one set of those clauses deals with prohibiting payments to members and directors of the organisation, uh, except for some really narrow exclusions like arm's length services provided by a director, uh, and payment of out-of-pocket expenses, for instance. Um, so if you are then paying directors because of their role, even if it's just an honorarium, so it's not a sitting fee, it's a fairly nominal amount, you would need to ideally have a clause in your document that sets out that that's permitted and the pre-approval process for it. And that would include a requirement from the members to approve the amount whether that's a requirement to annually approve the amount or whether there's the ability to approve a fee that will apply until it's changed, for instance. But if you have scenario where the directors themselves are able to set the honorarium without member approval, then you're, you're certainly running the risk of infringing other legal requirements. So, income tax. Exemptions with not-for-profits, there's some changes that come into effect on the 1st of July um, that probably affect everyone in this room. Are you able to just touch on some of those compliance changes and how they might affect everyone? Yeah, so the I think probably the most fundamental change for organisations is uh, historically to for, under the sporting category in the income tax legislation, uh, it's just a self-assessment around an organisation meeting the requirement uh, for an income tax exemption. And for clubs, um, that's a, a club society or association that has that that is established for the um, for a pastime, a sport, or I think recreation from memory. Um, and that is an annual self-assessment that organisations have to do. And there's no requirement to actually apply to any regulator like the ATO. Uh, to have that approved or whatnot. Um, whereas coming in uh, from the date mentioned, uh, there's actually going to be a new requirement to annually lodge a form with the ATO uh, in relation to your organisation covering uh, essentially what the self-assessment previously should have covered, but in reality, very few, if any, organisations probably actually did it. Um, essentially set, requiring you to uh, put on paper um, that you meet these requirements and then lodging it with the ATO. So what that what that will do in the short term is it will give the ATO a lot more visibility around how actually how many not-for-profit sporting organisations there are in Australia, um, whereas it, it probably doesn't have a great le level of visibility of that currently. Um, and in our experience, there's sometimes been organisations that probably don't actually technically meet the criteria, but have been self-assessing as a not-for-profit and where this could uh, go in five, whether it's five, 10 years, for example, could be a lot more compliance activity from the ATO in our space um, if it both from a public policy perspective, sees the number of organisations that are uh, income tax exempt in this space, and it will probably far exceed most of the other categories. Um, and also, if it if it gets to a point where it, it thinks there's uh, some borderline or questionable activity going on, then that could be a longer term regulatory focus. Uh, so running through some of the key uh, director issues, uh, the nomination process, eligibility criteria, terms of office, these are all things that both are set out in part or fully in your constitution, but uh, will flow into other critical documents that we'll touch on, like, for instance, the, the board charter um, and a board code of conduct uh, and nominations committee processes and procedures. Uh, which we'll touch on a little bit later in the presentation. So something that we very commonly get questions around are director elections, uh, requirements around who should be retiring, how you conduct the election, 
whether people, whether particular candidates are eligible for election in the first place. Sometimes after they've been elected, we get the question. Uh, so these are some of the critical issues that your organisation should be thinking about and actively building into your annual timelines around AGM and the like, because there's probably uh, no better way for an organisation to sort of show weakness in board policy and procedure than uh, errors or where it looks like the board doesn't know or is not fully across the process for the election, who's retiring, what the process is for nomination um, and those types of activities that should be standardised annual processes but can sometimes become really ad hoc and particularly where there might be a lot of corporate knowledge within one or two directors on the board or the company secretary and when they move on that knowledge we find in sport often isn't written down anywhere so uh, it might go and people aren't fully across uh, what they need to be doing. Interestingly one of the most common issues that we see in this space is where a sport either at the time or sometimes when it's too late and when something should have happened but didn't it's not across who actually needs to be retiring in a in an election cycle uh, and there's a number of reasons around that it's different sports have different processes for filling a casual vacancy some are filled to the end of the term some are only filled to the next AGM when there's a new election for that position uh, the there's different clauses that some have a minimum percentage of directors retiring each year irrespective of term some mandate term length so it can from organization to organization get a little bit confusing and there's no industry standard uh, that everyone adopts but uh, it's a scenario where where sports have run into real problems where a director has for instance served a year too long from a, a term which seems so obvious um, but has occurred at a, a range of sports of all different sizes including quite large SSOs um, thankfully not in Victoria uh, but uh, interstate that we've had to deal with so these are the types of things that that should be standardized within your organization and um, should be discussed earlier enough before things need to happen that any wrinkles can be ironed out internally or seek advice on what to do um, as you'll see, as everyone will have experienced through COVID, there's a, now a whole range of different third party providers that you can get for electronic election software, virtual meeting software and the like. So I'm sure everyone's using different solutions there. Uh, thing, critical things to think about when you're filling appointed director positions uh, and for appointed directors in particular, one area we see sports often trip up is uh, some sports will have a mandatory term for appointed directors some will have the ability to appoint up to a certain uh, maximum term length so often sports don't actually in that latter scenario specify in the resolution appointing a director how long they're appointed for um, generally it will be for the maximum period but often if there's a, a particular project that you might want a director in on a short term basis to fill a, a skills gap, if there's only a, a one or two year appointment when it can be up to three, if that's not properly documented, uh, then again, you can sometimes get into trouble. I'll skip over this so we don't run out too much time, but that's other things to keep in mind. Uh, so going to uh, delegations now. So in the sporting context, subcommittees are one of the most frequent areas of delegation. There'd, there'd rarely be an SSO that doesn't have some form of subcommittee, one or more, um, working on various issues. Obviously, common ones are nominations committee, uh, finance audit risk committee, however named. Uh, often in the high performance or elite sporting side of it, there'll be uh, subcommittees working in those areas. So fundamental points can relieve the board of some of the breadth of its tasks by having people with specialist knowledge in particular areas uh, dealing with things. So you will have generally people with high level sporting experience dealing with high performance pathways. You have CPAs, accountants, often risk uh, management professionals sitting on your FRAC committee. Um, 
of critical importance having a charter that sets out what the committee has the power to do, what its purpose is, and what are the restrictions on its powers. Um, the amount of committees that are set up and may have had a, a terms of reference originally, but no one can remember where it is or whether there was one. Um, everyone should know what the delegation is, both from the board side, so you know what the purpose and uh, activities of the committee will be, and to also ensure that the committee itself knows what it should be doing uh, and not going off on a on a frolic. Um, requirement to circulate minutes is an important one that's often forgotten. Uh, as directors, hopefully the content that we've gone through should ensure that you're not letting committees uh, simply operate in a silo without sharing information to the board and potentially to relevant parts of management, uh, reporting, and then again, in a similar sort of way to board composition, you don't want subcommittees of 25 people uh, where you're not actually going to have effective decision making being undertaken. Question at the front. Just hang on a minute, Tim, and we'll get the. The, re the requirement to circulate minutes, where does that come from? Is that from Corporate Act or? Oh, so it's not a it's not a legal requirement as such. There's no black and white rule that says a subcommittee has to circulate minutes. But uh, fun fundamentally, as a board, you should be knowing what subcommittees are doing and what decisions are being made. Particularly because often it will need board endorsement, or it will ultimately be a matter that the board has to approve or make the final decision on. Uh, so that's that's the purpose behind it. And then terms of reference is the the main spot to have that obligation uh, and then to ensure that that's that's the legal side the practical side who's running the secretarial function for the the committee is it do they have someone designated who is the committee secretary who uh, is the person responsible for those duties just had a quick one going back to the nominations committees and this is one that's come up in quite a few sports I've been involved with. Um, it's typically not documented in most constitutions. And whilst the nominations committee can put recommendations to the board for um, candidates to put their hand up for the board, do they actually have the power to enforce those recommendations back to the members? Because it's often um, unwritten in the constitution. Yeah, so this one, there's, there's a couple of aspects to it. So the first port of call is what, if anything, the Constitution says. So if the Constitution sets out that the nominations committee can do certain things, then obviously uh, that will apply. And we're, we're now more frequently seeing constitutions get amended to both enshrine a noms committee and set out some of its powers. And a, a common permutation would be it can deem candidates ineligible, but only if a majority of the or unanimous resolution of the committee and the composition of the committee has to include a director, member, rep, independent, for instance. Um, so first port of call would be looking at that. So if the constitution allows nominations committee to deem candidates ineligible, then straightforward. If the constitution is silent as to that power or even as to the nominations committee itself, then you look at firstly the delegations power in the constitution and what the board has established the NOMS committee under and relevant restrictions or uh, powers of the board to delegate to the NOMS committee. And also in combination with the clauses around eligibility in the constitution for um, board nominees, uh, that'll, that'll go, that'll either be completely silent, it'll be exhaustive mandatory requirements in the constitution, or it might grant the board discretion as to eligibility criteria, if if you're in a cup, if you're in the scenario where it's exhaustive and mandatory in the constitution, then the NOMS committee would really only be able to align with that. If you've got the ability for the board to create ad hoc eligibility criteria on a from time to time basis, then if there was proper delegation, then the board can theoretically delegate that to a nominations committee and it's then enforced by the board. Um, but 
when push comes to shove, if, if, if you didn't have a clause in the constitution that allows for ad hoc eligibility criteria to be established for director nominees, then it's highly unlikely that the nominations committee can of its own accord uh, create or enforce criteria, even if purportedly delegated by the board. The directors are another one that sort of pops up a lot. There's a misunderstanding, I think, with a lot of organisations is um, casual uh, vacancies. Uh, they often seem to think that the casual vacancy is filling the existing term of the person uh, that has possibly left or stepped down. It might have two or three years remaining. And in actual fact, under most rules, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, they need to go to the next AGM for election. But that's sort of often misunderstood and often slips under the radar. Yes, certainly one that slips under the radar. We would probably say we would more frequently see the clause say that they actually fill to the end of the term. Um, so that's that's certainly not uncommon, but it's it, there is a significant proportion that still have a provision that says they're only either they're only until the next AGM when they have to either be elected or where it might say it, it just goes to a general election. Um, sometimes on the odd occasion we see a requirement to hold a ad hoc general meeting to approve a uh, casual vacancy within a prescribed period of time following. But yeah, it's certainly, certainly quite, I'd say probably 60-40 one way or the other. Uh, so thinking about delegations, it's obviously not just uh, to subcommittees. Um, there will generally be in your delegations clause in the constitution, the ability to delegate to individuals. So that's important to note. So you might have, thinking about that uh, special project type scenario where the board might want to delegate certain uh, powers or authorities to an individual who might have expertise in a certain area to assist with a project. Um, so again, read the read your delegations clause closely to to work through what the board can do. Uh, generally, there will also be a clause in the constitution explicitly enshrining the ability to delegate to a CEO, however named. Um, generally, to administer the day to day business of the organisation. Uh, so first port of call is always the constitution and and what it says. When thinking about delegations. It's important to note uh, if in the same way that a board resolution can't bind a future board in relation to that subject matter, then uh, the a delegation by the board at X point in time can't bind a future board at Y point in time in relation to that uh, any decision to, to revoke that delegation, for example. So it's not something that's uh, enshrined forever. A, a board can't make a delegation that's uh, unchallengeable or unchangeable in future. And then for organisations with uh, staff, when we think about delegation, something that's probably overlooked in this space but is of fundamental importance is uh, internal delegations around uh, what the CEO can do, what potentially other members of the management team can do, both from a financial and operating perspective. So financial delegations, we're talking about the ability to uh, make financial commitments on behalf of the organisation to third parties generally. So uh, if you are a director, uh, probably think, is there anything in place that says what your CEO can bind the organisation to financially uh, themselves without board approval versus with board approval, for instance. Uh, so often we'll see larger organisations have a an internal delegations policy that will set out uh, these are the types of matters that the general managers can approve up to X dollars, the CEO can approve up to Y dollars, and then anything over that needs board approval. Uh, and then similarly, from an operating perspective, uh, it's generally matters like the length of a contract. So can the CEO bind the organisation to a 10-year deal, for instance, or would that need board approval, uh, subject matter, and then also exclusion? So uh, can management sign up to indemnities or other guarantees, for instance, of the organisation, or would that need uh, board approval? So 
Um, this is really critical from a, an efficiency perspective because if you're getting up to be a larger organisation, then inherently management needs to be able to properly administer the day-to-day -day management of the, the organisation. And that requires entering into these types of ongoing contracts with service providers and the like. Uh, so you've always got to balance up sort of rigidity versus agility. So the board needs to have oversight and decision-making powers for some matters that are of um, such level of importance or a particular subject matter, but uh, there is a, an absolute legitimate need and interest for management to have the, the power to go about the ongoing operation of the organisation. I think that was a question over here. A question from the floor. Um, does it matter if your constitution delegates to a general manager specifically and then the title of that person and I'm talking about myself has changed to CEO does that are they one in the same legally or does that need to go through an approval process with members no certainly if if there's been a change of title but the role has essentially stayed the same and often we've seen that where it was previously re referred to or still is referred to as a general manager but they are actually operating as an executive anyway then no, there wouldn't be any need to, to technically change it. It would be the type of housekeeping change that you'd make in future if you're pursuing other changes. No, no legal need at this point. So it is really important to have a policy in this regard if there are already these delegations in place, but they're unwritten. And for, for those with staff, it's really important to actually, if you don't have anything in place, but there are uh, delegations in effect operating that have that have been established over time organically uh, it's really important to to document that from a risk management perspective but also for the board to really ha have a careful think about what are the types of matters or the significance of matters tenure or financial commitment that the board itself decides it needs the the final decision making power over uh, and it really helps streamline efficiency, people know what they can and can't do. And uh, ultimately, in our experience, it takes away a lot of the left hand not talking to the right hand scenario when uh, people are given the power to make certain decisions. Um, and like everything, when you when you empower good people to do things, then generally that helps in efficiency. So hopefully all of you would know of your organisation's board charter and be able to recall some passages of it. Um, it's probably one of the, the more significant documents in this sort of subject area that uh, directors and officers should be aware of. Uh, that, that first dot point broadly sets out the overall sort of mission of these. There's no one industry standard for a board charter, whether we're talking about the sport industry or any other industry. So it's a little bit of uh, pick and choose your own adventure for particular organisations. Uh, sometimes a board charter will be very defined. Sometimes it'll be a lot broader in scope and almost be a governance policy and different charters include various different things that other organisations will have separate, like a code of conduct, for example. So there's the first point is there's no one set way to do a charter. Um, there's some of the usual content that we see in a charter at a, at a minimum. Um, they don't, one of the benefits is they don't have to be an extremely long document. It's, there's no need for chapter and verse and the longer the document, the less likely people are to, to have actually read it or understand it in the first place. Um, but where a charter can be really useful is it sets out standardised processes for common scenarios where people may otherwise be unaware how to go about a certain thing. So some practical examples we see if a director, a particular director wants information from management about a subject area, Generally, that's a topic that we would recommend is included in the board charter because you don't want ad hoc requests going to management at all times from different people, overlapping, sometimes asking the same uh, exact same questions. Um, so that's a that's a critical point. Uh, seeking external advice is another one that we often see 
in a board charter. So what's the process for that? Uh, is it a suggestion to the chair and the chair then uh, talks to the person or is it do certain things need to have a board resolution before they get actioned? Um, so some of those practical processes that uh, will come up in the day-to-day -day life of being a director of an SSO, um, it's worthwhile having a standardised process so people can actually know what to do. Roles and responsibilities of different director portfolios is a big one. Uh, independence requirements, conflicts of interest requirements, particular responsibilities of the chair, um, noting that the constitution will, will generally set out how the chair's appointed and that they're the chair of a board meeting and a general meeting, but that's about it. So are there particular responsibilities over and above uh, the other directors? Uh, compliance with the charter and what happens if there's an allegation that a director has breached the charter? Um, and then code of conduct. So are there going to be behavioural standards over and above a potential whole of sport code of conduct that might apply to, to these individuals? Just a question from the floor. Last question. Um, can you comment on the consequences of not following the charter, particularly if you know, an organisation had one of those really, really, really long ones, and it might say do certain things, but um, you know, what are the, you know, apart from ending up in court, which really yep. happens, what, what, are there any real consequences? I've got, I've got a slide in about three slides, so I'll touch on that exact question. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this, there's content in there for you. Uh, skip over again, so just have a read of that in your own time, if relevant. Uh, so coming on to board conflict, so this is uh, that exact scenario where there's either board conflict or there's a director who's breached board policies and procedures. And this is uh, without doubt, from our experience, the most difficult terrain for an organisation to uh, traverse because of a couple of different things. Often there's no standardised process for the organisation in place, so it's by nature ad hoc around what you do. Uh, and then secondly, there's a whole range of legal technicalities that make dealing with these things, unfortunately, quite difficult and challenging. So uh, we will touch on that now. Um, a couple of principles there around what may, what people may think is uh, a board conflict or dispute, but uh, might not actually be. Um, the critical one is, uh, some level of tension and disagreement is absolutely healthy at this level and when we look at the Royal Commission into financial institutions uh, one of the overarching sort of criticism or comment coming from the commissioner was around a lack of challenge at the board table when decisions are being made so uh, there, there's generally no problem with playing devil's advocate on even a decision where everyone's broadly in favour uh, that the board would simply be exploring all options if someone deliberately took the alternative position and argued it, uh, at least at the meeting. So um, often what can be robust discussion but is ultimately productive can be misconstrued as conflict. So uh, that's one to, to keep in mind. So here's, in our experience, the most common types of disputes uh, that we see for sport organisations. Uh, so whether a director has a conflict, whether they have a material personal interest and therefore need to sit out of certain decisions uh, is probably first and foremost. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, misuse of board information, so leaking of documents or leaking of information that led to particular decision making. Uh, legitimate uh, dis debate around financials and risk. Uh, again, in the sport context, undermi actively undermining board decisions uh, is quite a common one uh, and can lead to high levels of conflict. So standard scenario, board makes a decision. There might be a faction within the board that wasn't happy with it and didn't support it, but ultimately got outvoted uh, and then go around telling everyone in the sport, left, right and centre, that they both didn't support the decision and it's a terrible decision. And um, the boards, the board should never have made it, notwithstanding that they uh, remain a part of that board. Quick question before we move on from that. There was just on the chat uh, relating to conflicts of interest. 
the query is whether or not the conflicts need to be um, recorded and made public to the members and the stakeholders for transparency purposes, or should the conflicts of interest at a board level just be kept for our own internal purposes and use? Uh, and is there any sort of direction or advice on um, making those conflicts publicly known to members and stakeholders or, or just keeping it internal for the board? Yeah, there's no there's no one way to approach this. Uh, I will say so uh, for companies, for the CLGs out there, um, the related party transaction regime under the Corps Act uh, covers certain scenarios where there would be a conflict um, and the organisation proceeds with entering into something that constitutes a related party transaction. So those need to be disclosed in the annual report of the organisation. So they'll inherently be uh, included and made public for people who get to the probably the last page of the annual report. Um, as to disclosure of interests, uh, we would rarely see those uh, disclosed, particularly uh, for, for a number of reasons. So firstly, it's common practice and often good practice to disclose interests that haven't uh, actually reached a conflict at that point. They may in future or the director in question might have something that they know is probably or potentially going to come up in the sport at some point. So there would always be encouragement to have those individuals to disclose before they actually legally need to. And it, if you were making disclosures of interest public, then you're probably undermining that um, very worthwhile purpose. So uh, there's, a, there's a balancing act when thinking about that. Um, when you actually are getting to the stage where a material personal interest is a conflict, then um, there's, there's obviously disclosure obligations under both sets of legislation upon the individual. So, uh, and there will generally also be a clause in the constitution around dis disclosure of material interests uh, in the conflict register of the organisation. Uh, but again, there's probably good reason why in the same way it's rare if ever that an organisation would simply publish board minutes because there's a whole range of confidential information in there that might prejudice third party discussions etc. Um, there are good reasons why disclosure of material personal interests uh, would not be made public uh, and in our experience it would be um, I can't actually think of an organisation that we work with that, that would do that. Uh, so the, the uh, ongoing list of types of disputes and conflicts uh, that we see, um, I'm not sure whether there's any that uh, are unfamiliar to people. So, so first and foremost, when we're dealing with conflicts, it's really important to highlight the key role that the chair plays, and that's whether there's a documented requirement for the chair to do various things or uh, whether just by necessity the chair has to step up and take an active role in dealing with the matter. Um, that's primarily because when we're thinking about the chair, they're the first among equals. Their uh, chairman is actually short for chair manager, so uh, a big part of their role is to manage the board and uh, inherent in that is managing conflicts for whatever reason, what board conflicts that is. So whatever for whatever reason they arise, it's a, a fundamental part of their role to, to be dealing with these things. And often we see there's been, when a query comes to us around a board conflict, it's escalated over a number of matters or a period of time where early intervention and action could have probably either prevented it entirely or significantly reduced the uh, damage to the organisation. That's not always possible, but uh, it's certainly, um, I think, in our view, pretty pretty common. So often that first step will be intervention by the chair around a discussion with affected individuals, whether that's one or more, whether it's in a mediated, sort of informally mediated session or direct conversations with particular directors around matters. Um, that's a really important fundamental role of the chair and active intervention uh, should be encouraged because letting things uh, fester without any action being taken only leads to further material prejudice once potentially lawyers get involved. 
So here's a little quick guide on you, you do have a fundamental dispute and the chair may have spoken to the individuals and uh, resolution has not <laughs> been achieved, unfortunately. So the first step is, are there policies in place that govern behaviour of directors? And if so, have there been has there been an alleged breach? Because commonly, whilst it's very difficult to prosecute director duty breaches because you really need a regulator to do something or you potentially need to take legal action, a sport is free to govern its members, directors, office holders under its own policies subject to certain laws uh, and potentially uh, a director breaching one of those policies is, is often the precursor to a dispute or conflict. So looking at what your policies say in relation to uh, that area. So if we're talking about uh, allegations of bullying, harassment, abuse, for instance, you'll almost certainly have a policy in place to deal with that, whether it's national integrity framework, member protection policy, whether you have a whole of organisation code of conduct, whether your board charter has a code of conduct for directors, there will generally be, generally be something that uh, would cover that conduct because those policies are often very broad. So the next step uh, is obviously following the policy if you have it uh, and it sets out the resolution procedure and fundamentally does the conduct breach that relevant policy as determined by the applicable mechanism and procedure in the policy. So that might be uh, ex externally determined, it might be through formation of an independent committee to determine allegations, for instance. There's always an overlay of difficulty here where disputes might involve confident, partly confidential information of the board. So uh, it's quite important to have in these policies and procedures the ability to make ad hoc decisions uh, in certain circumstances where uh, you can't resolve something without, uh, if it's a director and another director in conflict without disclosing confidential information that shouldn't be uh, seen or heard by others in the organisation. So whatever your policy or procedure sets out, uh, it is important to have some form of catch-all provision that could allow for uh, a potential mediator to come in, for instance, or some some form of uh, legal professional under a duty of confidentiality to, to assist. One matter here that's really pertinent is a fundamental difference between companies and incorporated associations as it relates to that section of the Corps Act and the prohibition against public company directors removing other directors. And where what that does is it uh, potentially significantly restricts the ability for a CLG board to resolve to refer someone, a, a director, to a disciplinary mechanism because you start getting into potential territory that uh, it might constitute a removal of a director under that clause and be prohibited. The top right wording is directly from a constitution of an incorporated association uh, and those entities are not subject to that restriction. So it's a lot easier for IAs to have a board resolve to send a particular director who's allegedly breached a policy um, either under the existing policy mechanism or under an ad hoc process through forming a tribunal or uh, having an independent decision maker to determine whether there's been a breach uh, and if your constitution has applicable wording then the penalties could potentially be automatic cessation of their position on the board. So it's something to, to keep in mind for CLGs uh, and the inability to, to simply remove a director or, for instance, to recommend removal to an independent panel, etc. So some of the top points to assist you around best approach, because again, one size does definitely does not fit all with board disputes and uh, even to the extent where depending on the uh, alleged breach or alleged conduct, the way you deal with it can fundamentally differ depending on who the person personalities and who the individuals are involved. And 
this is where, again, uh, management by the chair and management by the board around uh, just the interpersonal type of relationship that uh, is required for a cohesive and effective board can uh, come into play. And then when you're managing a dispute, here's some of the, again, key issues to consider because in our experience, director disputes will very frequently flow into broader whole of sport issues, become public, become a well-known secret within the organisation. So uh, here are some of the things to think about. Obviously, media and communications is a big one, stakeholder management. We often see uh, scenarios where you might be negotiating a large grant with government or, or a sponsor and you're getting to the pointy end of negotiation where you've got uh, significant dollars uh, on the line. Uh, if they get uh, wind of significant director potential dysfunction or dispute, then uh, that can be a quick lever that they can pull around uh, pausing those kinds of negotiations. So having a, not only a strategy to resolve the dispute, but a strategy to deal with all the other stakeholders that might be impacted is, is key. Uh, defamation uh, is a whole another topic, but um, in our experience, there's defamatory statements flowing left, right and centre in, in director disputes. So it's something to, to think about. Again, personally, if you are involved, uh, you're subject to defamation legislation. Uh, so you don't want to be saying anything defamatory. Uh, and then also whistleblower requirements for companies. So again, a whole nother topic that uh, needs another presentation, but often when we start getting into board conflict type areas, there's potentially allegations that are made that uh, when they're made to a director, it could constitute a whistleblower complaint under your, under both the whistleblower legislation in the Corps Act and hopefully your whistleblower policy that you have in place. Uh, and there are some really stringent requirements around how to deal with that. So uh, keep that in mind as well. So if there's nothing that comes to mind for your organisation that's in place for dealing with these matters, here's uh, some considerations for you moving forward and things that you can think about. What we're seeing more and more of is this type of example where there's uh, some form of declaration that directors sign uh, when they take office in relation to uh, that or that covers this type of scenario where they're found to have been in breach. Uh, again, there's there's question marks around legal validity of some kind of self-executing resignation clause, but it can be a lot easier to hold individuals to account, particularly in, for behavioural standards, if you've got some form of signed document of this nature that was in place when they commenced. Uh, so some takeaway dot points on what the organisation can do to avoid disputes. Uh, hopefully they can be taken away and implemented to the extent your organisation uh, feels appropriate. Uh, so not to uh, take up any more Q&A time, happy to hand it over to questions now. Just a question from the floor. Just a very quick one, differences um, that would be, well, uh, differences between CLGs and IAs, I guess, the sporting associations, pros and cons? Uh, so in one sense, they're very similar. So they they both have uh, the, the sort separate legal persona. They can do the same things. They're both uh, entities that are specifically um, created by legislation for not-for-profits. Um, Ten years ago, there was quite a large difference from a reporting and compliance perspective, but over the journey, the Corporations Act has been tiered for CLGs where small organisations, so those under 250,000 annual revenue, now have very straightforward annual reporting obligations that broadly mirror what an incorporated association would have. So. The, the two fundamental differences are there's slightly more administration for a CLG because uh, 
you're a public company, so a lot of the or all the public company obligations under the Corps Act apply. You have to deal with ASIC around a range of things like change of office holders and the like that an IA doesn't have to do with consumer affairs. So there's, there's slightly more administration on a day to day basis, more forms to lodge with ASIC compared to uh, lodging with consumer affairs. Um, so that's that's the first fundamental difference. Um, end of year reporting is the other difference. Uh, but as I said, Corpse Act has slowly become uh, sort of mirroring the small incorporated association procedure. So under the IA, IA legislation, there's tiers and only the top tier annual revenue needs to automatically have an audit and submit financial audited financial statements subject to what the constitution of the organisation says. That, that is now um, identical to the Corpse Act. So the, the one that one big difference has been eliminated. Um, so there are there is also slightly more help in the Corpse Act around what to do in certain governance related situations because the Corpse Act is a lot more prescriptive for the internal governance of companies compared to the Incorporated Associations Act. Uh, so you're not going to materially suffer being a CLG, but I think on the whole, there are still really valid reasons for smaller organisations, particularly clubs and associations to remain IAs. And Simon, a related question to that on the chat in relation to director identification numbers uh, and who they are required by and, um, and who should be applying for them? Yeah, so first point, not required for incorporated association directors. It's only the corporation's regime that uh, it covers and if you're a company director. Uh, so under fairly recent changes, you now need uh, a unique director identification number that attaches to you personally. Uh, it's only a one-off. So once you apply for a DIN, uh, it's with you for life. Uh, I can't remember the exact dates, but we're getting close to the point now. I think we're at the point now where if you are going to be a company director for the first time, then you're required to apply for and hold a DIN before you commence your position. Uh, important to note, that's a personal requirement on the individual. It's not the company that has that obligation and it's not the company that is liable to a sanction if you fail to do it. It's you personally. So. Uh, for anyone that's a company director and doesn't have one, uh, you should uh, have already had one and I'll uh, go and apply this afternoon. Uh, for anyone that hasn't uh, hasn't ever been a company director but intends to, um, you can validly apply for one if you intend to be a director within the next 12 months. So you don't have to be uh, elected or appointed or even have uh, a prospect in the next month or so but if you for instance were going to apply in the next election cycle for your organization uh, then and it's within 12 months you can apply now no if you're only a director of an incorporated association no need hi simon just in relation to governance obviously risk management is pretty important what's your thoughts regarding you know organizations having a risk management uh, policy and the necessary risk work under it yeah it's a really good question and it's it's a really good point and again it's a whole nother topic but it's it, it so directly links to directors duties because a lot of the role of the board around uh, monitoring the organization is dealing with risks uh, that the organisation faces for, for whatever topic area, whether it's financial, legal, uh, sporting, injury, reputational, all those types of matters. So they're matters that the board will inherently be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. Uh, so it's certainly very beneficial and, and smaller organisations will probably be doing a bit of this without realising, but there are uh, sort of almost uncontifiable benefits from having a some form of formal risk management policy in place. Firstly, because part of that process involves assessing the common risks for the organisation and putting them on paper and working through treatment strategies for an entity. And um, one of the fundamental misconceptions about risk management is that you have to try and eliminate all risks, whereas 
there are actually a range of risks that no organisation can eliminate. It's about working through effective treatment strategies, which can be minimisation, it can be taking out insurance, et cetera. So uh, it's really helpful for even small organisations because often the risks will equally apply between a large and a small organisation. So going through a process of documenting what your fundamental risks are in the different areas, working through treatment strategies uh, and setting those out in one place uh, can be highly beneficial. And uh, from a director perspective, it's one of the best ways to show that you're actually meeting your duties to act in the best interest of the organisation. Okay, uh, so another question, perhaps it's a summary question uh, for me, just in relation to a lot of the smaller sports and perhaps it, they're aren't as advanced on the journey of looking at their board policies and procedures. Uh, where would you recommend as a sort of starting point some of the key takeaways of, um, of things they can start looking at? Yeah, so I think first point is to try and document what you currently have. So often organisations will have certain policies covering different things, but through turnover of the board, corporate knowledge being stuck with one per particular person who's now left, there might not be an awareness of it. So our first step is definitely document what your sport has at the moment. Uh, secondly, uh, I would strongly recommend utilising work done by others in this space. So uh, certainly uh, Vic Sport, Sport and Rec Victoria, uh, the Australian Sports Commission, even though it applies to NSOs, have a really useful resource library in the governance space and a lot of the templates that they have can equally apply or with some changes apply to SSOs. But uh, certainly, um, and, and this question wasn't to, uh, for me to plug Vicsport, but Vicsport does have a really useful set of Victorian specific SSA uh, templates and resource materials in that space. I would also recommend looking at what other sports are doing. Often there'll be a range of public publicly facing documents available because often they'll apply to the sports members. So they need to be made public. Uh, so there's uh, sufficient awareness. So uh, why not look at what other sports are doing in the space, particularly some of the larger ones to get an idea of what types of policies and procedures they have. Uh, and that can equally apply outside the sports sector too. There's a range of uh, standardised board policies, particularly a board charter, for instance, that uh, certainly is in no way sport specific. Uh, and if you look at a, a sport board charter compared to a, a standard not-for-profit or a charity, they could be very similar in 95% of it. Yeah, that's Question from the floor. Um, a question around board nomination process. So we're about to go through this in my organization and um, I guess suggestions on where else to find really skilled independent directors. I'm sure there's some in this room. If you want to talk to me later um, to fill some vacancies that are skill specific um, that we're about to come up with retirement in the next board cycle. Yeah, particularly if they're skill specific, so you might be looking at a particular professional industry, uh, leveraging word of mouth contacts within your organisation to work out then how can you uh, get your advertisement or get, get the word out there. So, uh, for instance, we, we often have uh, clients come to us and, and ask the question, do you know of anyone who would be interested that has this skills basis. So if you're looking for legal, if you've got just some, just a lawyer within your sport network, they don't have to be on the board, um, they are going to be best positioned to have a group of people um, who they can then access and you get that multiplier effect and also the ability to look at are there industry bodies or associations that have job boards or things that we can put our um, advert up. So, Leveraging personal contacts within the sport of any of the directors or the like is uh, probably a really useful one when it's uh, skills based in particular. Um, and then looking at probably what the other sports do in that space as well and, and talking within the industry about what are the wins that they've had when looking at that particular area. Um, certainly there's a lot of knowledge within the industry that is available but isn't shared 
well enough. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't hesitate to, to talk to other sports. Um, we've assisted sports with developing like expressions of interest process. So you do like a, a job description, a role description of what you're looking for, and then you can go out and put that onto your LinkedIn's and um, professional sort of organisations, your stakeholders, and then rather than necessarily being um, you know appointing people, but you get these expressions, and you can develop a a bank of people. You know, we've had sort of 30 people apply for finance director expression roles previously, so uh, that can also work very well. Uh, also. Yeah, and there's the Vic Sport Board Bank as well, uh, where we can list any opportunities uh, that you might have. Um, there's some other industry board banks around the Sports Commission, I think, has one as well. So, um, yeah, I think we might have just coming close to end of time. Might be time for one last question. Okay. So it's a comment from the floor there from those um, online in relation to using the AICD uh, board bank and the community, uh, the, 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 the community directors institute uh, as well. So uh, on that, uh, I think we might be done for questions and we might hand over to, to Lisa to wrap us up. Okay. Right. Um, firstly, a round of applause for Simon. <laughs> Fantastic information. Some of it a little bit scary. Um, most of <laughs> Most of it extremely helpful and the PowerPoint will come your way afterwards, Caitlin will get that out to you. So my advice would be to share that with all your board members and maybe even you, your GMs or senior staff if you have those in your business um, because they need to just understand where it's at. They need to know that what you're saying is the board member who's interested or the CEO that's interested enough to come along and make sure things are, are right is the correct information. A lot of board members say, ah, to do that. Um, I've been on those boards myself and I've reported into to boards like that in the past. Um, but it's good just to tinker and keep improving things as you go on along each year, each board meeting, bring that stuff up. It might be a good agenda item for the next board meeting, just to talk about the things that came up today that you don't think you've got right, that you want to work on, get some help from fellow board members and other people in the business to help you. But thank you, Simon. That was fantastic. So thorough um, and helpful Landers save us on lots of occasions. We lean on them a lot and we really appreciate it. But yeah, if, if you do have opportunities um, for positions that are coming up in your sport, we have a board bank, so we put it up on the Vic Sports site, but we also send that information to some of the top lawyers and counting firms and also um, women on boards and AICD. So we try to, particularly for those skills-based positions where you're not looking for someone from your sport, you're looking for someone from outside. Um, there's a lot of senior positions in corporates where um, part of the KPIs of that particular person in, in working their way, way up through the organisation is to contribute to community in, in a board um, kind of way. So uh, we have lent on those people for our committees and boards at Vicksport and had some successes getting people into SSAs across, across the time. So feel free to send those through to Caitlin on our admin email and we will post them um, on the site, as I said, and then project them off to other organisations for help. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for um, coming. Great to see you. And please help yourself to drinks and food on your way out. Feel free to stay around for a few minutes to chat. Um, and thank you again, Simon. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye now.